We should have had a tap at the Project Payphones by now. A wire there will get us the drugs. Keep pushing, we'll get a whiff of the money too. Now I know you're serious about climbing that career ladder, and I know how slippery it gets the higher you go. But for me, I don't want to go to no dance unless I can rub some tip. Alex Cottrell and Toby Huntingford present Caught on the Wire. This podcast is an episode-by-episode analysis of HBO's widely acclaimed TV series about the city of Baltimore, its people, and its many problems. Find more information about the show and all the episodes online at caughtonthewire.wordpress.com. Hello, welcome to Caught on the Wire. I'm Toby Huntingford. I'm joined today, as always, by Alex Cottrell. This is our fifth episode of the show. Um, Today we're going to be looking at The Pager, which is the fifth episode of season one. How are you doing today, Alex? Uh, Yeah, it's uh, just ready to get back into it again. This is is quite a big episode. Uh, Make a lot of progress here in terms of what's been going on, a lot of payoffs in this episode. Yeah, there's there's a lot of kind of small things, a lot of small things happening, mm. rather than kind of few big things which we've been used to in previous episodes. So it might be a difficult one to kind of um, digest in terms of a discussion, but we'll we'll do our best. Um, I believe we, you've got something to report. To we do. We we have some news which is quite unusual. We normally just kick things straight off, but there has been talk recently this week of the HBO announcement uh, that. The wire is going to be remastered in HD, and not only in HD, but also in 16:9 widescreen format, which is uh, quite a big development for anyone who's a wire fan. Um, and they're they're going to be playing it in a marathon over 60 weeks. They announced that um, they announced that it was starting this week, although it turned out that that was a fake kind of leak from someone. So that it's actually unannounced. But if you go online, you can find the trailer for the new season. It's very much a teaser with not very much in the way of kind of substance to it but it certainly gets everyone excited so it's officially um, it's officially announced it's like a real a f- thing yeah abs- absolutely I was almost considering because I thought it would be happening this week almost considering saying perhaps we should take a little break and like resume in you know in sync with the actual rewatch on HBO uh, or we could have done that after season one finished but uh, unfortunately we might have to wait a little while for that um, but that would have given our viewers kind of a more immediate reason to come along and listen. Um, so well, we'll, we'll see what that, happens. We're not it. that far ahead, I guess. You know, exactly. So if if it does start any time soon, we can possibly make some adjustments or maybe not. Just let everyone catch up. But yeah, it's just very exciting news. Um, I was telling Alex earlier that the whole 16.9 thing's a bit strange because the show was originally filmed in 16.9, which is why the 16.9 option is there. But it was never intended to be shown that way. So whatever you see beyond the 4-3 frame isn't intentional so you could argue that perhaps they shouldn't really show it because it doesn't really it's not really relevant to the show it was never meant to be there um, but I think either way I'm I'm quite excited to see a different version of The Wire uh, however it may look so potentially a lot of um, negative space to deal with um, and it kind of especially in this episode there's some good examples obviously we talk about sometimes the cinematography there's some good shots in this that I think if they were 16-9 and you had all that excess information on the left and right hand side, yeah. Like you, like you mentioned earlier, the characters might feel a little bit squeezed in the middle, and I don't know. Yeah, it'll it, be interesting it, to see how it looks. It won't satisfyingly fill that frame up, will it? Um, HD will be strange as well because I always associate that the the wire with that slightly sort of rough and ready, grainy yeah. visual style that you also have on things like The Sopranos. It might feel a bit more apparently like a like a TV show, as if it's being filmed, won't it? Which is something that we didn't get from that kind of grainy documentary style. So, yeah, it could change it quite a lot. But it's very exciting anyway, and gives us another reason to rewatch if you didn't have one already, which is quite difficult. So <laughs> It's very interesting um, how a simple kind of visual format change can really sort of irrevocably alter a TV show. Yeah, no, completely. But it seems like something so basic, like, oh, you know, what aspect ratio does it looking you know people don't tend to ask that kind of questions about a show but you know it does have a it does have a big impact on framing yeah. and a sense of space within the screen definitely definitely um anyway um 
there's our news. Yeah. This week, Alex is going to be recapping for us. Shall I hand over to you, sir? Yeah, the recap is going to be a funny one this week because there's just so many little things going on. So yeah, I've, I've tried um, to compartmentalise it as best as possible into various characters and how they intersect and if there's any sort of arcs going on because there really is just a lot of really small little nudges ahead being made in this episode which makes it satisfying because it just it's a really busy episode but it also makes it harder to recap because I mean if you recap everything that happens in this episode it will take up the entire hour I think so yeah it certainly feels a lot more bitty than last week and I don't think it quite has the same impact that last week's episode did but it's certainly really good it's some of the first major plot developments I'd say particularly the stuff with Brandon like it really moves things into gear so um I'm excited for it anyway yeah, yeah. kick us off man kick us off so here we are episode 5 the pager so we start off well our opening scene I'll uh, the very opening scene I will talk about in a bit but we'll start off with uh, Judge Phelan approving the affidavit to clone D'Angelo's pager. And uh, once they have the equipment online, in order to follow this, they learn that the dealers are sending phone numbers via pager. Uh, but they must be masked by code, as none of the numbers that they use as they come through actually work. Um, in a thus far uncharacteristic show of usefulness... The code is actually cracked by Prezbaluski, Roland Prezbaluski, who has been a bit of a hump thus far. But uh, he establishes that the code being sent through the pages works based on how the numbers are presented on a phone keypad. And using that code, they can work out what the phone numbers are. And with the pager wiretap established, later in the episode, we have Freeman telling Daniels that they need to escalate the wiretap to the payphones in the projects. And that's the sort of the following of the wiretap, the actual wiretap itself in this episode. Yeah, so that's kind of the, the details progress. There's some definitely some really nice scenes there. Um, back to our transitions, we had that great one where Phelan talks about celebrities being much smaller when you meet them in person. Cue Omar walking down the street whistling. Which yeah, was quite, it's a really was curious quite uh, line that because it's very obviously dubbed. Um and it just kind of jumps out at you very solidly. A bit of a rewatch line, I think. I think when yeah. I, I think when I watched it the first time, I was like, "Wait a minute, what did he say?" And you go back because it's such a sort of obviously, it really comes out at you that line. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a strange one. It feels very failing. Um, and we have obviously the Prez is an important part of the detail work this this week. And there's a couple of good scenes with him. We get Polk making another appearance. He's uh. His presence is waning on the show. You sense that he's about to be kicked off. But uh, there's the, the the telephone photocopy scene, um, which uh, is quite funny. Um, there's another strange one that didn't really have necessarily much logic to it. I'm not really sure why he needed to, to photocopy the telephone, but seeing Polk kind of uh, dismiss the detail for it was pretty funny. Um, yeah. And uh, it was just great seeing Prez redeem himself in general. Uh after that horrific introduction at the 2 a.m. field interviews, um, and uh, it was particularly happy to see McNulty was very pleased with him as well, which is unusual because we've seen McNulty eternally frustrated so far. Um, we even see him give him a big sloppy kiss, <laughs> um, which you know really kind of cemented uh, Prez's kind of welcoming into the crew, and he's found himself. Yeah, he, sh and he does show where his strengths lie in this episode. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's very good. Um, it calls forward to his uh, work in season four as a teacher. It does uh, yeah. definitely call forward to that, especially when he's explaining the problem and talking about how the kids on the street wouldn't understand if it was if it was maths. You know, they wouldn't be able to grasp it or pay attention long enough to make sense of it. Yeah, and that kind of calls forward to his you know pedagogy, if you will, that comes out later in season four, which is quite Absolutely. a nice call forward, I think. The only reason he cracked it is because he had to think about it through kind of a kid's head, didn't he? And I don't think anyone else spent the time to think about doing that. And Prez obviously had that kind of teaching intuition to think of it from a kid's perspective and look at that phone. And it actually made a lot of sense once he'd, once he'd spent a couple of hours with it. So, yeah, it was really kind of nice to see that. 
It's suggested throughout the show as well who in the detail is more fidgety than others. You get the sense that, you know, a lot of the people on the detail probably wouldn't sit down and spend hours trying to work it out. Except for maybe, like, Freeman. Yeah. Although, for, for free, yeah, it's strange that Freeman didn't attempt to crack it, isn't it, after what, all we know about him. Um, but, it might uh, have been a bit obnoxious if he did that, too. Like it just yeah, kind of, it, he, he cracked, a super cracked the case wide open over yeah. and over and over again. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Might just um, become he, a bit silly. I guess he was looking for patterns or something like that, wasn't he? He was, he, he was the, he's kind of the monitor wiretap man, so he was... Ru- after the patterns rather than the actual content of the numbers and little did they know that behind the scenes Prez was brewing up the solution so it was, it was really nicely done well Lester Prez, is barely in this episode no that, that is true he does have his, his one kind of rub some tit scene at the end but, yeah uh, that's that's about it yeah I mean I, I quite enjoyed that scene which kind of ends the whole wiretap strand for this episode um, I think it kind of really justifies Freeman's character through and through the show um and it shows that from the start he was all about the police work um, and the career was kind of a second thought for him. And for me, when, when I was re-watching, that was kind of my way of rationalising what he did in season five. Because uh, I think that's one of the biggest problems people have with the show is that Freeman's character is just kind of wildly out in season five. And I, I still think there are things about him earlier that kind of set him up for that. And this is a big scene, I think, that really defines that for him. So when he says to Daniels, you know, I, I'm not going to go to any dance unless I can rub some tit. And I get it that, you know, you're, you're playing with the devil up there on the career ladder, but that's the way I see it. So I thought that was just a nice way of connecting things, perhaps in a more tenuous way than some. But um, Speaking yeah. of season five, I think that uh, one of the complaints that are levied uh, that are uh, you know, shown at season five... Uh, about how fast things move. Things feel a bit rushed along in season five because there's less episodes and they do cover a lot of sort of somewhat controversial ground as in developments seem to happen pretty quickly, especially in terms of McNulty and him, you know, faking yeah. these murders and, you know, learning how to fake a strangulation murder extremely quickly. But yeah, definitely. we kind of have that in this episode as well, where the code is sort of discovered and cracked in the same episode. Um, yeah. And I think no one ever kind of really complains about that. And I think it is why, and this will obviously happen once we eventually reach season five, which is a long way, feels a very long way off, um, that I think season five deserves to be defended because there are plenty of examples in other seasons such as this where problems can be quickly moved past, but it doesn't necessarily become a problem for the episode or the season as a whole. Yeah, it's weird because the rushing for season five very much feels like a product of its kind of squeezed 10 episode time frame yeah um rather than because they intended to write it that way but uh yeah i it's it's, it's definitely a fair point uh, I, i'm I guess. getting my defense of season five in early because i really like season five and a lot of yeah, people who I, watch the why i don't like it we, we've discussed this at length that season five is possibly i mean for me i think it's my second favorite after four um and uh, a that lot is of the complaints bold. You reckon? Yeah, that is that is so? quite bold. <laughs> well, there you go. Season five for me was a lot of fun, and I think the complaints levied at it are not quite justified. But that's obviously a chat for another day. Um, yeah. So we're we're still, I guess, on the strand of the wiretap here. Have you got any other any other points that you'd like to make about those scenes? Um, a couple of things related to the wiretap, but it, or that'll come later. They're related to other things, best suited for another part of the episode so far. Okay, cool. So should we move should on we, to the next one? Just press on, yeah. Okay, so the next strand is with Omar and his crew predominantly. So after Omar, uh, John Bailey, and Brandon tr- uh, plan, and then obviously later trap and rob some dealers. Uh, on an east side corner Bubbles then supposedly spots and recognises Omar's van and leads Greggs and McNulty towards it where they're going to try and catch Omar with a gun and get him to become an informant Um, later Kima and Jimmy follow the van into the cemetery where an unarmed Omar refuses to snitch Uh, McNulty informs Omar that John Bailey was killed earlier on 
and Omar then reveals in not quite as many words that Bird was the one that killed Gant in the first episode or it didn't happen uh, yeah it did happen in the first episode sorry yeah and um, that he also knows that Bubbles is their CI so that's kind of what happens with Omar and his crew in this episode much shortened version yeah it's um, again just adding more to the lack of convention with Omar uh, from what we saw last time <clears throat> so we have that that strange scene where he voices opposition to cursing um in Brandon's last scene um, and we have the uh, just oddly both I mean Bailey I remember what the first couple of times I watched the show they chat about Bailey a lot in this episode and they haven't spent much time really defining who he is um, and he is obviously that third member of the crew but it did take me a few watches to really understand that and because Bailey Bailey's death occurs off screen it's kind of a bit of a curveball it's very um, disconnected isn't it because the the show also put places a lot of emphasis on it later on when obviously Putin and Wallace spot Brandon and they kind of talk and they show the communications coming through to the wiretap. It kind of looks at that in refer- in relation to, you know, yeah. if they'd had it up earlier yeah. or whatever, they could have caught the Bailey communications as well. And it kind of places a lot of emphasis on how important it was. But like you say, we don't really know this character and we never actually see him get killed and... Exactly, yeah, it was difficult. I mean, it it raises a a really good point, I think, at this point. Like, now that we've got major plot developments kicking off, we realise here that, like, so many important scenes are off screen, and we learn that the wire's kind of therefore preoccupied with, like, mechanics and theories rather than, like, the plot and the character development. So, um, it's more about I think it's theming above all else, isn't it? Theming and symbolism are king in the wire. Yeah, so it's like the process is king. It's uh, it's there's nothing visual spectacles. They're not interested in it. They're interested in the process of what's happening, um, and this includes a few things in this episode. So that stuff like Stinkham's fresh territory, um, Brandon's death, perhaps most hev- evidently, because it's conveyed through the through the DNR recorders rather than through the event itself, which you know shows how what we really care about is what the technology picks up, not what's actually happening at the other end of the phone line, sort of thing. Um, and you know it's we just we just have to kind of discern these things through the through the process. So it just kind of shows up what the wire is really concerned about showing us, and it, it kind of becomes a lot more clear in this episode, I think. Um, so bringing us uh, bringing us back to Omar, yeah, I think we learn a lot more about his uh, you know his very moral character. He's got his codes that he lives by. You mentioned already him chastising Brandon for swearing. Which yeah. seems somewhat in contrast to the uh, scene in the last episode where it was just you know, the word fuck for about 10 minutes. Yeah. Seems like an interesting yeah. contrast, doesn't it? Like, Yeah, no, he he is the only character who doesn't swear, as far as I'm aware, in the whole show. Although he does let a few S words fly, I think. Although some a lot of fans have tried to claim that that's him mocking other characters, so it's justified. But yeah. It is a, it's it's very um unusual and just again very Omar who is everything but convention through and through. Yeah, so. and dislike snitching as well, which we learn in the uh we learn in the cemetery. Yeah. Although he you get the sense that he kind of loves it underneath with all the snitching that he eventually ends up doing. Yeah. He's but, not exactly um, innocent in yeah. regards to that. Especially seeing as almost straight away he reveals something. Exactly, like yeah. he reveals birds the shooter. Like you couldn't really have gone bigger than that. I don't like snitching, but here's some information that you wouldn't yeah. have been able to get hold of otherwise. But if if he didn't like snitching, that would be a conventional character trait. So they had to kind of make him a snitch so that he did def- continue to defy that convention. So it it kind of works well with him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean that that scene with. Oh, Melty and Greg's. I think it was trying to be, you know, a big kind of monument scene. I mean, there wasn't too much I could say about it, really. Um, but yeah, it's it's a nice kind of development for Omar, and we see that he's going a very different path to what we may have assumed when we first saw him, and that he's going to be very much kind of a lone wolf police, almost police related character rather than street related. So we really get to grips with yeah. a certain idealization of Omar in this episode as well, especially where he's um, you know, coming down the street whistling his little tune and everyone's rushing away kind of like you know this is almost like a force of nature isn't he like, yeah 
back back to the whole force of nature idea like that th this is the first time they show him in his stereotypical uh, well not stereotypical but his kind of classic whistling down is is it the first time or did he do it last episode as well uh, I think it's the first time I think it's the first time yeah yeah it must be yeah so um yeah, he's coming yeah. down the road in his duster jacket and he's got his uh, bulletproof vest on, shotgun in hand, and everyone, yeah, he, you know, rushing away quickly. He's certainly, you know, grown into himself quickly. He That uh, that old character that no one knew about, you know, that's just arrived on the street is suddenly this uh, this whistling Western madman. Uh, yeah. You know, it's qu quite a quick transition. And everyone knows who he is so immediately. So. Yeah. So, again, it's just showing how... Omar's character hasn't quite been introduced correctly, but you know, it's, I I remember enjoying that whistling scene. Yeah. Particularly, um, and there's that other great one in his dressing gown in season four, which is another fun favourite. And we so, have um, um, Brandon. Does he, doesn't he say that he's the is the epitome of danger or the the embodiment of danger? Is it? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we kind of get it, this sense that Brandon kind of. We see a certain through the lens. We see a certain idolization for Omar and his kind of you know the power that he has and yeah. the fact that he is somewhat free. For he's independent to the game. He kind of toys with the game rather than being in it, so to speak. Yeah, um, it's very nice so it's kind it. of you know the the show toys with that idolization of him as well. But we see it through Brandon too, who really obviously idolizes Omar as well. Especially, yeah. I mean, if you're going to describe someone as the epitome of danger in a sort of like, <laughs> yeah, in the way that he says it, then it's demonstrates danger what he really personified. About. I think it was, yeah, like it was. Um, is that it? Is it danger personified? I think it was. Uh, Omar said something like, you know, we're going to bring some danger, and then Brandon's like, and that's you then, right? Danger. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind of a, yeah, definitely kind of, definitely idolization. So, yeah. yeah, he's he's climbed the ladder very quickly, that Omar. Should we move on to the next? Yeah, bit? let's 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 get, get going. Okay, Stringer and Avon are planning to take over the Edmonton Avenue corners, and as a result, Stinkham is given a promotion to head up this new expansion of territory, as well as some points on the package for his trouble. Uh, we kind of see a certain idea of how the business works here about points on the package and people being on salary, which is kind of interesting. Uh, in the meantime, the two Barksdale kingpins both, um, both did I say kingpins? That is what I meant to say. Catch up with D'Angelo. Uh, Avon and D'Angelo visit Avon's brother, who is uh, in a coma in a care home. And Stringer visits D'Angelo to tell him that there might be a snitch in the uh, crew somewhere and that he should withhold people's pay to reveal who might have some extra income based on who asks for money and who doesn't. And later on, D'Angelo learns about Stinkham's promotion whilst talking to Orlando in the club. So yeah, through that um, train, of, train of events, we kind of see what happens with Stringer and Avon and how they both interact with D'Angelo in this episode. Yeah, it's uh, a good strand. Uh, we'll start with that that territory sk scene with, um, is it Scar? Or the, they're going to take territory off Scar? Yeah, who's that's this right. elusive character who we've never met. Um we kind of Which, see him at the end, don't we? Do we see Sky during Stringer's phone call? Maybe we see. Yeah, they a they point him out just before um, they're about to get the call about Brandon in the arcade. They're they're watching a couple of guys just you know in the street, and I'm sure okay. somebody says that Scar or something like that, and we see oh, a couple of guys just stood around. So I think we kind of see him from the back or something. It's so not like a character silhouette. introduction or anything <laughs> yeah. like that. But yeah, it just it makes the scene oddly a bit disconnected. Like, I mean, it, it's clearly there to show Avon's uh, ruthlessness, uh, but I think also the fact that he's very kind and loyal, which is such a big thing with Avon, and the fact that he wants to you know open up this new territory and make it Stinkham's big thing, and you know make a hoo ha for one of his workers who's done well, which is kind of a really nice aspect of Avon. Um, but the the actual kind of idea of the territory is kind of irrelevant, I guess, which is, again kind of speaks to the idea that. It doesn't really care about the spectacle. It just cares about what's actually happening in the process. Um, and as I as I mentioned in the recap itself as well, we see a le bit more of the business side of dealing yeah. drugs here. We talk about and you that, know who's on salary and who has points on the package and yeah, who and also they talk about um, 
putting in the the best quality product to draw people in and then presumably once everyone's hooked because avon talks about this in an earlier episode you know what are they what are the what are they gonna fiend drug fiends gonna do once they're hooked or something like that presumably yeah. once he's got them hooked on the good product he'll just swap it out for the rubbish that they've got everywhere just else and bring in the dog shit yeah. yeah absolutely yeah definitely and they also um show us that that for some reason that safe feels very uh um, important. I'm, I know it comes up a couple of times again in season one, but they, they really make a big thing of that safe at the end when he kind of pulls all the hundred grand out. I think that they eventually crack the safe, don't they? They have to hide it away somewhere. But um, yeah, it's it definitely kind of it's a, it's a very good indi- way of kind of bringing us into the whole drug trade, and certainly not a um, a tourist's version. Like you really have to get the Google out to work out what a lot of those terms mean, like the whole points on the package. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it does does that well. Also, really kind of establishes Avon's duality, that kind of loyalty versus his ruthlessness, uh, and that makes him just so hard to dislike as a character. Like Avon's very very likable, and you see that again in the the scene with his uh, is it Avon's brother? Is it? Yeah. Um, so that's another one of D'Angelo's uncle. Yeah, that's some, right. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. So it's just yeah, it's just a really nice scene. Um, I remember watching that and it was like I kind of wondered why I ever rooted for Stringer over Avon which a lot I remember doing that you know in season 3 I was like definitely on team Stringer but when when you see that Stringer is all about self-motivation or self-preservation and Avon's just kind of so family oriented and values all this loyalty and you know has all this 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 talk about how you know blood is everything and blood is the most it's, it's really nice kind of way to talk to D'Angelo even if he is a bad influence overall it was it's just a really nice scene that you know really really brings shines a lot of light on Avon well by this point in the in the uh, season we've seen that both Avon and Stringer are capable of sharing the love as it were um but like you say I think you know, Avon really emphasizes that to you know you'll always have family you know it's because it's blood you know yeah um, yeah that that reminds me actually of the uh, voiceover for uh, it's a strange wire montage. I, I'm, I sh- I'm def- we definitely watched this uh, a year or two ago. It's like a D'Angelo montage on YouTube where they've they've used kind of like ambient rock to play over a few of the key D'Angelo scenes, and it goes through his arc. And they have like all these voiceovers from the show. A lot of them from like uh, D'Angelo's mum and Avon. And it's kind of it's, it's a really unusual way to watch the wire because you're so used to watching it without you know with all the diegetic music and the rest of it and it kind of really creates a big kind of epic montage of the wire it's kind of really trailer like it's definitely worth checking out there's also one for michael as well so um yeah they're they're good those videos definitely yeah. we'll we'll find you a um an auth- well we'll find you the youtube channel for those next episode or possibly this episode if we can find it um but definitely check them out well that um, that alone as well like it's the fact that uh you're seeing all of these scenes one after the other when normally they're obviously interspersed with a load of other scenes it just kind of reminds you of just how fluid the arcs are when they're put into context with one another yeah even when isolated yeah. from everything else it still makes a kind of really nice forward movement narratively speaking mm, definitely like D'Angelo is very very strong particularly when when you get that tragic arc in the first half of season two which kind of ends the video it's it's really really nicely done and uh you you realise how much music kind of paints the way you watch videos and films when you watch these because like the, the tragedy really just ramps up so much when they preach into the choir s- there they s- yeah they just spit out the music yeah so um yeah so it's, uh, it's definitely worth checking out another recommendation uh well, well we've still got to discuss that stringer scene haven't we yes um, this is a this is a great scene as well um, do you want to give your take on it first um well it's I mean, it's, uh, I don't really have loads to say about it, but uh, just that I liked seeing a bit more of Stringer's ruthless business sense, and it's very clever to sort of draw people out who's got that extra income uh, based on who asks for money, basically, when they withhold it. I just think it's a clever little idea, really, and it shows, like you were talking about, that self-preservation is trying to protect the crew from whatever snitch is in there, but he also sees a way to make a bit of money out of it it's always with the money with Stringer mm. it's such a smart move um, and the thing that makes it seem even smarter is the way it's delivered I think you know this is one of Idris Elba's first kind of proper scenes in the show 
and like it's so nice like it's one of the most naturalistic scenes I just think the way he delivers it is just fantastic um, it's just kind of so natural and oddly it's also the only scene I don't think we ever really see him wear track suits again um, and like by season 3 he's barely out of a suit I don't know if it's just an indicator of his character development development or kind of a design choice that they chose to phase out but it was just a bit strange seeing Stringer in kind of sweat I guess the Americans call them sweats um, but yeah it's, it doesn't really feel like Stringer Stringer feels a little bit more feels a little bit above that um, I've noticed that in a lot of the conversations that they have in the pit especially if it's like only two or three people sort of together in one place talking they always have these like dolly zooms going on as they're talking mm. so like the you know, sort of cinema in terms of cinematography, there's always like the person speaking, and then they'll have that sort of Hitchcock style moving background by using a dolly zoom. And it's just mm. a, it's a strange, it's almost an unsettling effect. So that the, almost the buildings like... around them becoming bigger as they stay still, sort of thing. It's a really kind of unsettling effect, normally associated with horror, but it's it's used it's used in quite a few places during extended conversations in the wire, especially like outside and. Yeah, something to uh, look out for in the wire because it's a really interesting effect. I didn't notice that it was used in this scene at all. Actually, I I, th- I can't remember if it is. Um, I think it is. I have a mm. feeling that it might be, but it's, it's, it's not in this subtle. scene. Then definitely yeah. others. <laughs> uh, there's always that. I mean, we, we're we're hopping seasons again, but it's so easy to do. Um, there's that season two towards the end Ollie zoom, which is great when you know Frank's about to get whacked. Um, He's chatting to Nick about kind of the docks, and in the background you see the grain pier gradually shrinking through the dolly zoom. Yeah. It's like just such a such a beautiful kind of uh, visual visual uh, metaphor. So uh, yeah, some very nice use of the dolly zoom in the show. Um, and Alex is very very clearly very observant and picked up one here as well. Um, I could be wrong. Though. I'm probably going to go back and watch it again later and see that I'm wrong. We'll have a little look later on, and then we can. Uh, post our apologies if they're required I'm sure they won't be <laughs> um, yeah so that's that's the the D'Angelo Avon Stringer strand yeah let's uh, well, move on then to the other people in the pit so Bodhi Poot and Wallace so Bodhi uh, starts off with pissing off D'Angelo when he throws a bottle against the wall near a distracted Wallace who is playing with a toy when he should be working and the two have a little bit of a confrontation before they're interrupted. Uh, staying with Bodhi, he's uh, later on caught by Hark and Curver for escaping the juvenile detention centre. Uh, and But any attempts to try and make a deal with him end up failing in the interrogation room, which some, well, has some rather violent consequences. But uh, later on, this seems all cleared up when they play a bit of pool together whilst waiting for Bodhi to be processed through... Uh, the what's it called juvenile something or other I've got juvenile intake I think intake, isn't it something it, like that yeah, yeah. Um, and they missed the eight o'clock or, and they had to wait like four hours for the next one or something yeah but they have, they have a nice um, game of nice game of pool and a sandwich yeah which is yeah, all definitely. very civil cause very civilized exactly yeah I think it's it's a great indication of how Herc and Carver are all about having fun rather than keeping it professional and it mirrors that cinema scene from season 3 quite nicely I mean the cinema scene was a lot more on the nose but it's kind of a a nice connection between how you know at the end of the day they're all kind of people rather than cops or robbers um, and Herc and Carver I don't really care for which one they are they kind of care about having fun so and it's um, funny to see the good cop bad cop thing kind of get reversed and you know even yeah. actually says you're supposed to be the good cop. Like. <laughs> that was a, a very dark bit of comedy there, but you have to laugh. Like it was, it was funny. Um, and the, the way Bodie played played um, Carver for a good couple of minutes before like, they underestimate him clearly. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's just very, very admirable from Bodie's perspective. You think they treat and, him with a little more respect, seeing as he managed to escape the actual detention center itself? I mean, it was pretty easy as we saw, but they don't know that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. I mean, it's. Again, Herc just being an idiot. I mean, we I forgot to mention last week actually. There's that scene with Herc visiting Bodhi's grandma, which is kind of the only time he's perhaps ever likable in the show. Um, and he kind of settles down and apologizes, and 
uh, hands out his card. It's, it's it's a very unusual kind of move for Herc. Quite a touching um, scene. Yeah, we, we never really see it again. I mean, it could just it probably is just another another tactic for drawing Bodhi in, but it certainly shows that Herc thinks outside the box on at least one occasion in the show. So. Um, but yeah, just just something that I forgot to mention last week and was kind of annoyed that I forgot to mention it, so I thought I'd try and squeeze it in where I could here. <laughs> um, so I hope it wasn't too much of a shoehorn. But um, yeah, where so were we? we were... Poot and Wallace spend a bit of uh, time together in this episode as well. Um, they are hit rather hard by the withholding of money by D'Angelo following Stringer's orders. Um, and they ask D'Angelo for an advance, or rather Wallace asks for D'Angelo for an advance, whilst Poot stands nearby looking a little bit sorry for himself. Um, yes. Thus kind of proving that they're obviously very loyal, and that they're they're not the snitches, and they don't have any other income other than what they're doing for the Barksdale organisation. Mm. Although, if you, you'll notice that that scene is, the start of that scene is... Uh, focused on Sterling is it Sterling and Cass who are the other kind of two minor members of the crew in the pit and they're looking very shifty and kind of sitting down and moping away somewhere and it's clear that there's it's not clear what's happened but it's clear that there's been some sort of thieving going down um, yeah right which is definitely worth checking out I think it was it's very subtly done but because we, we do eventually learn that I think it's the girl Cass who does does steal from the pot um Avon breaks all her eggs for it. I was so also ju- I was also just going to add that obviously with Poot and Wallace, later on we see them at the arcade where they identify Brandon, and call in to let their superiors know. And uh, later on we see the information of these communications being logged in at the detail office, which kind of ties in with the wiretap having been set up. Yes. I think yeah, um, there's a parallel trying to be played between uh, Poot and Wallace in this episode where um, Poot seems to be a bit of in a hurry to be an adult you know, he's very obsessed with sex and you know, staring at the women going by and everything, he's kind of in a hurry to sort of have things adult style as he wants them, whereas Wallace is the opposite and still has that innocence and he's playing with the toy and you know, I guess there's a certain kind of like yeah, people running true. in certain different directions in terms of their maturity because yeah, ultimately, no, you know, the large body of people running this, if we talk about the number of people actually doing sort of the everyday work in the Barksdale organisation, it's kids, it's children, you know? Mm. Yeah, and, and the ones, the only ones that are behaving like kids are the ones who haven't been completely corrupted. So, you know, Wallace is a bit of a, a bit of a, a sticking out thumb. Um, so, yeah, it's, it also, Poot says that he was banging Arletta Muzon, which I managed to ca- catch from the subtitles. Uh, don't know if there's any relation to our famous bow tie man. I was but, thinking uh, that when I watched it, yeah, I was like, there's, that's a very kind of obvious Muzon, like to have that yeah. put in there. It's got a, it's not a, not a mistake, I'm sure. It's not a coincidence. It's just a callback or a call forward at the very least. So, um, yeah, just, just a nice little Easter egg, I guess, for us to see. Um... Uh, there's not loads to say yeah. about the other kids in the uh, pit. No, I, really, is there? I did think the scene with the toy with Wallace was was a great example of like the real, real, real moral complexity. Because uh, you know, it's uh, what Bodie does just chucking the bottle at his head is that like, a horrible thing. Uh, and again, you kind of have to question why he's such a likable character, and you realise that he's upset that Wallace isn't working and he's being an inefficient drug dealer. Um, and that's completely consistent with Bodhi, who believes that you know he's, he's got to work his way up, and he kind of, you know, he doesn't take any shit, and he's been conditioned to react with violence when things aren't quite working properly. So it's is it, again, it's just complete consistent characterization, but you can't really pick a side because everyone, everyone's so well drawn. So there's another kind of one for me where the uh, morality really stood out. Mm. Um, yeah. Right, on to the next strain then. Yeah, go on to the next one. So in Homicide, uh, Bunk is informed that the casing found at the Crescent case links Barksdale to the murder. Uh, As per Landsman's prediction, which obviously he is not particularly humble about. (laughs) Um, And when McNulty visits the Homicide Department, he is told about Rule's offer 
that we hear in the previous episode about bringing him home if he wraps the case up in two weeks. Um, and he's also told about the murder of John Bailey, which he obviously reveals to Omar later on. Then he goes with Bunk to visit a witness in the to the Crescent case, uh, a woman named Ty Wonder, um, who also used to be a stripper at Orlando's. She reveals that uh, Deirdre was Avon, Avon's girlfriend, uh, but later threatened to expose him. And she also tells them about the club, and this leads to the detail discovering that it's a front for the Barksdale organisation. So Bunk makes a few gains there post the famous fuck scene. Yeah. Um, and we obviously know that uh, it's Weebay who is the guy with the, is it the Colt 45 who's done all the murders that the Crescent case links to yeah he later uh, um, later admits it I think later admits it so obviously the, the really astute viewers viewers even would already be doubting D'Angelo's story of the tap 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 um, yeah that's and... an interesting did we did we talk about that in that episode did we talk about how it was you know, he was making it up. He was twisting the story to make it sound like he did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we 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 didn't mention it, but yeah, it was it was clearly sparked by one. I think by one statement that Bodie makes, where he talks about um, if it was if it was you in that juvenile facility, you'd still be there. And like he saw that as a real challenge of his authority, and had to kind of fabricate this story that he was on, he was with Weebay when Weebay did the shooting, but he pretended he was Weebay. So yeah, we haven't really mentioned it, but. Absolutely, yeah, it's a complete fabrication. And it shows that so. the sh- the wire is quite happy to, you know, through its voyeuristic style, it shows the lies as well, so the audience can be tricked as the characters can. Like we see in the interrogation scene with Bunk and uh, McNulty, where they obviously trying to make D'Angelo feel sorry, so they make up all that stuff about the witness. And again, with D'Angelo telling that story about the murder, which he didn't actually do, you know, we are fooled as an audience as well. It's a kind of interesting mechanic that we see in the show quite a few times. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, what else was there in that strand? So we had the the Crescent gun success and uh, Landsman's very lucky kind of win. And then we had... And then they uh, go to visit Taiwanda. That's right, and she's <laughs> one of the... one of the victims, friends or something like that, isn't she? Um, and that cracks them open with Orlando's club um, which is a nice development for them and so. we also kick start off Freeman's interest in following the money this kind of starts off really because now that we're dealing with assets in relation to the Barksdale organisation if they really want to bring it down and really find out you know, what is making these big drug organisations happen He'd start yeah. following the money, as Lester says in a later episode. Yeah, and the, the idea that they're now kind of gathering these these lists of assets, they they are kind of making headway into that finance, aren't they? Yeah. So this is kind of the start of that. Everything's coming together. Yeah. In this episode. Definitely. A lot of a lot of payoff in this episode because, just speaking about the episode generally, we see in the first few episodes that there's just a lot of struggle for the. For the uh, people in the police organisation, and they're dealing with the bureaucracy and everything. But right at the start of the episode, where we see Judge Phelan approving, you know, signing off on the affidavit, the detail makes so much progress in this episode. Like more, yeah. probably more progress in this episode than any of the other episodes combined. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And we know that they're on the cusp of getting their actual wiretap, uh, which is just going to bring them even more um, progress and quicker as well. So. Yeah, it's just a really satisfying episode from the details perspective. So there's a couple of other small bits, because uh, this, this episode had a lot of small parts that were sort of disconnected from everything else. But in fact, some of those smaller parts were actually, you could say, the most about them. Um, but the first I'll bring us to is uh, when D'Angelo takes Danette out to that expensive restaurant. And obviously they feel a little bit uh, out of place there. Do you think that uh, it shares a certain relation with the scene in season four where um, Bunny Colvin takes the kids out to that expensive restaurant and they sort of feel out of place there as well? There's kind of a certain mirror image. 
yeah, there's it's definitely conjures that up. Um, both scenes are very good. I think that the season four one with the kids is like definitely more memorable uh, when Bonnie takes him to the steakhouse, just because they are so far outside their comfort zone. Um, but I think this one is great as well. Um, you see so much of a kind of a sociological or psychological study of D'Angelo and the familiarities of his upbringing, like the idea that D'Angelo has been told to take things. So he just takes the cake from that tray um, and, you know, thinks he has a right to a good table that's not by the kitchen. Um, and th this idea that, you know, um, just not taking no for an answer and Donette, you know, pushes him to fight for a table but D'Angelo's kind of got enough humanity to see sense that that's not really worth it um, and you get a sense that anyone else from the pit who is in this situation would flip a shit um, in this situation um, but D'Angelo's kind of got that conscience um, there's also the lack of trust is very visible with the the knife that kind of comes down to wipe the crumbs away I mean it feels a little bit false that shot the way it's framed is a bit like oh look it's a knife it's kind of a Hitchcock shot you know here comes the knife down in the shower but it was um, I guess it's you know you can kind of get inside D'Angelo's head and see that all that paranoia about constantly getting jumped is there um, and then there's obviously the f finally that problem that he has with people seeing through his him to his dirty money um, and it's a great contrast with the net who never seems to have understood the concept of guilt and therefore she's able to live happily with the money that she's supported on so um, yeah that, that was my take on it I thought it was a really interesting exploration of the Angelo yeah it, all, all very good points it's, um, it's a very interesting scene as you say and it shows paranoia being a big part of all the drug dealers go through and we, we see it right at the start of the episode before the titles with uh, Avon obviously being very paranoid yeah he goes up to those kids that have got their like hockey gear and thinks that they might be you know shooters from a rival gang or something like it's you know, it shows quite a, an alarming level of paranoia which Weebay quickly picks up on yeah but and, uh... it's kind of you know in a way Avon and his whole organization have it kind of easy because it's right at the start and the wires only just got started. I mean, you look at Marlowe's situation later on. I mean, he won't even go near a phone, you know. Yeah, and that is true. Uh, you know, so it's it's, it's a phones just become a, a non thing, don't they? By yeah. season three, it's just the burners are there, and then beyond that, it's just face to face meets. Like it, it really does, it really does evolve as a criminal trade. Like all the adjustments they have to make. Yeah, yeah. So. Relative to the rest of the uh, show, it's quite, a, you know cushy situation for Avon but still he has quite good reasons to be you know I think his paranoia is somewhat justified given that yeah. the amount of gains that are made and uh, all the things that are happening around him yeah and this this ties directly into that epigraph be it a little slow be it a little late you yeah. know like the idea that you have to you know well, we, we won't no, jump we won't jump too far into the we won't jump yet. we won't jump plenty to say uh, the other small bit that I was there's a well there's a couple of others the other small bit was um, McNulty's relationship with his ex-wife and uh, <laughs> there's quite a funny scene between him and Greg's where we're they're in the car um, McNulty calls his wife and they have a bit of an argument and then he calls the mother of his children a cunt or <laughs> doesn't as he might argue <laughs> which is quite an amusing yeah. episode and then and then I like the bit later on where we see him assembling the IKEA furniture, and he's kind of trying, and he's very, you know he's very drunk, and he's tried to put it all together. Yeah, and eventually he, you know, he does the right thing and does actually get it all sorted. And then when he goes to pick them up, he finds that um, Elaine has taken them anyway because she didn't think that he would actually follow through, and he actually has. So, yeah, it's like, like an I'm... analogy for his his life, really. I mean. McNulty's trying to piece together his life this kind of it should be simple but it's actually difficult he eventually does it and even when he does it doesn't seem worth it because nobody nobody has kind of hung around and waited for him to do it yeah um, completely I, I on rewatches I was totally on Elena's side in all the McNulty versus Elena stuff like you can totally see why she doesn't want McNulty anywhere near her kids like he just has no no structure to his life really and he tries so hard to kind of do a bit of parenting here and there. I love the the, the little um, token bit of parenting he does. 
you know, and he, he sees his kid's bike and he moves it like a few inches up the stairs just to kind of feel like he's done a little bit of parenting. Um, dad work, yeah. Dad work, like you know, just kind of put almost just to ease his conscience the tiniest bit, and you like, you know, <laughs> that didn't you didn't need to do that, but you're not going to get any closer to your kid today. I'm sorry, McNulty, but it was just you know, you kind of see that's the mentality he's got at this point, and he's really, really fighting to get it back, and it's just slipping away from him. And good on Elena because. I think Elena's got the right idea, to be honest. And again, it just speaks to the the really, really complex morality. It's, of, yeah, it's, um, it's difficult because you know we feel McNulty's struggle here, and we know that he, you know, in many cases has good intentions, and he, you know, he doesn't intend to do any harm to his children through his lifestyle. But him being the self-destructive character that he is, like you say, we as an audience are not not likely to trust him if he was in that situation with his children because like you say he has no structure to his life he's constantly drinking he's constantly uh, you know whoring, whoring himself out you know yeah he's not a particularly parental like figure definitely not so I thought the stuff with Elena had quite a lot of depth to it really although the stuff with Ikea for some reason that they always bring up they brought up Ikea a few times in the show and like they keep showing people not being able to do Ikea furniture or assemble it and I don't really get it because like Ikea furniture is kind of really easy or it's notoriously easy so it's just a bit of a strange one I mean I know McNulty's drunk fair enough but Greg's gives up in season 5 building her um um is it Isaiah I think her daughter um she builds a bed for her and or him even and completely fails at it so it's just maybe <laughs> David Simon has a bit of a hate for Ikea that he likes to express in the show or maybe it's uh, a you know it's a pretty blatant uh, product placement maybe they said they would do it but only if they showed it being hard to put together <laughs> yeah just a bit of evening it out yeah yeah definitely I can't imagine Ikea agreeing to that no not at all that is true. Um, and finally, there's one other small bit. Uh, and there's not loads to say about it, but you might want to mention it. Um, we have Bubbles visiting Johnny in the care home where he talks about him having... Uh, Johnny has HIV. Uh, HIV is actually mentioned a couple of times in this episode. I think Bodhi and yeah. Pooh are talking about it earlier on as well. Uh, as, or the bug as it's known in, yeah. in wire speak, which took me a little while to work out what was going on, but yeah. Um, for me, this all this scene said to me was that it reinforced why Johnny is one of my least likable characters in the show. Like, I really, really despise Johnny. Um, he's just a little bit kind of, you know, sadly, he's just a little bit pathetic. Yeah, he's n- not got very little redeemable to him, really. I mean, it was sad that he was beaten so viciously and sad that he tested positive for HIV, but... I mean, he's just so consistently narrow-minded, never learns, slave to kind of that ghetto society in which he's grown up dies dies to the overdoses refuses to help the police not even for fear of retaliation just because the code of the streets tells him not to and it's just kind of it is just it's so frustrating to watch him kind of you know bubs giving him all the best advice in the world and him just not you know wanting to listen to any of it so well given that he is essentially bubble's student in a way I think there may be an element of guilt on Bubbles' part of having maybe taught him some elements a little too well, you know, stuff to do with the game. Because Johnny says that, you know, Bubbles taught him that stuff to do with the game. And I think maybe when Bubbles' view on it was a little more fundamental, perhaps earlier on in the episodes or sort of in the time that would have been before the episodes, as it were, mm-hmm. perhaps he may have ingrained that information into him a little bit too well. Or yeah. rather, Johnny had a very. You know, they have the kind of personality that would have latched onto that, and as you know, as we see, he is very stubborn towards it. He's there with this sort of like, was it like a colostomy bag or something? And uh, and he's still just like, I'm ready to We're, rip and run. I'm ready to, you know, I'm ready to inject the best heroin in the streets back into me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's just completely not been in, impressioned upon at all by the events that have happened to him. Yeah. So there we go. That's Johnny. Yeah, the guy who uh, doesn't die that tragically in an in the Amsterdam in season three, um, and that that's that's pretty much it for events in the episode. That's kind of covered all of the the events, really. Sweet. 
Um, I'd perhaps like to mention one more thing. Yeah. Um, the the scene where D'Angelo finally embraces uh, Donette's charm. Uh, not Donette. Um, what's the name? Chardine. of Chardine. Chardine's charms. Yeah. Oh yes, he sees um, her give the money back. That's right, and uh, you know it finally hit me when I watched it this time that the reason he perhaps went for it or you know decided to embrace Chardine this time is that. This is the first person that D'Angelo's met in the kind of ghetto culture or in this in this uh, society of his that kind of intentionally didn't try to scam someone when they had the opportunity to. Um, and, you know, for D'Angelo, that's an incredibly attractive quality and makes a move on it very quickly. So, I, you know, that, that's kind of, I thought, particularly when you contrast that against all the guilt he was feeling at the restaurant, it's a nice, almost like safety net for him when he sees someone do a good deed for someone else. Um, in a world where he's so used to people just scamming each other and doing each other like dogs. So, perhaps that explains his motivations. Yeah, that that makes sense. It's a rather nice little, again, it's kind of a, another one of those payoffs. We're talking about payoffs in this episode. There's another really small one there. Obviously, earlier on, we see her approach him, and this is kind of like building up to a, you know, a final payoff at last. They're actually going to organize a date. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It also uh, says something about Tiangelo's idea on loyalty. I mean, he has, you know, he is loyal to the uh, crew and whatnot because of his uncle and everything, but he's not above questioning their ideals or their morals and whatnot. And again, in relation to loyalty, we see that he can't be all that loyal to Donette if he's willing to just go on a date with another woman <laughs> because she does something morally agreeable. Yeah. So it's, you know, it says a lot about... Um, D'Angelo's ability to stick with things. Yeah, I mean, he probably feels very trapped by Danette as well, just because she's such a an arbiter of that lifestyle that he kind of wants to leave so desperately. So, yeah. yeah I it's guess nice it's see. more like, I mean, yeah, he's, uh, like you say, it's because of that gesture of her not scamming someone when she had the chance, but it maybe it's also that there's a sense that everyone else is content with their position to do with the organisation, you know, particularly Danette, like she's got everything that she wants, she doesn't care. She says herself, you've got the money so you can be whoever you want to be. Mm. Um, but we see that Shardine doesn't necessarily feel that way, it's not about necessarily the money, she's got other ideals and probably wants to get out of doing that job at the earliest opportunity. And as we kind of later find out, the same is true for D'Angelo. Yeah. Match made in heaven. So there's kind of kindred spirit thing going on there. Fortunately, it's just not to be. No. So, I've even though I know we've said about the spoilers, I just can't bring myself to say it. <laughs> just because yeah. it's such a tragic. <laughs> you know, it is events. horrible. I don't know why I'm laughing, but yeah, I mean it's it's a very very graphic moment that's kind of cuts very deep. Um, so t- should I just close out? But we, we kind of talk a little bit about the th- what I thought the theme was so if we have you kind of have with the access to the pages um, the police are now kind of beginning to understand what they're up against and the theme so far has really been about how the police don't understand or they're always two steps behind or they're always incompetent and we're now start- starting to see them kind of challenge that and the smarter police characters are beginning to re-examine the assumed operational high ground upon which they operated so we see Greg's first asked the question of how complex the code can be if the knuckleheads are using it um, but quickly see her examine it from the other side of the coin what does it say about us if we can't crack it and you know everyone in the office is taken aback by the discipline of the code and I think that was kind of a key kind of key thing that kind of worked through this episode so that would kind of be my main it feels message. like they have a lot more freedom to do their jobs and do what they're good at and and that as, a, that, as a result, kind of, they are rewarded for that. They are rewarded for their in, uh, initiative. Yeah. And it's funny that it's that should be you. the case, especially when you consider mm-hmm. that in this episode we see nothing of the between heaven police and upper echelons. We don't see Burrell, we don't see Rawls, we don't see Forrester, we don't see any of those people. Oh, that's very true. They feel yeah. they're completely detached from the episode, and as a result, you know, the result seems to be both narratively and in terms of how we view the episode, 
the members of the detail detail feel so unrestrained in their actions and it it rewards them yeah yeah there we go so um we have a few concluding sections that we always do yeah so do you want to um, start with um favorite scenes yeah um it wasn't as difficult as last week I think Ooh, actually well it was difficult I'm torn between two really uh, Stringer and D in the pit early on um, when this Stringer displays that kind of incredible skill uh, incredible management skills very very clever way of working out who's who's snitching even though it's not a snitch um, and the way the way he delivers those lines is just so natural. Perhaps the most naturalistic lines I've ever seen in the in the wire. It just felt like it was right out of the ghetto, um, and you completely sucked in. Um, and you know, Stringer's not in many season one scenes, but when he is there, like the scenes really, really punch and deliver. So for me, I, for some reason, I just really enjoyed that scene, and also just the restaurant scene as well. I think is very, very, very strong and just very insightful. So those those would be kind of my two. I'm sorry, I couldn't pick one, but. Well, yeah, I was gonna go. I was gonna pick two as well. The you already said one of mine. I was, I was gonna do the um, restaurant one as well. Uh, but I'd also gonna throw a bit of love out for a slightly lighter scene in the failed interrogation of Bodhi, where Carver is uh, obviously trying to play his good cop routine. And I one thing that I particularly like about that scene is just the the way it's shot when it starts out we see these really like against the wall shots where the majority of the frame is just the wall and Carver yeah. is like pressed up against the side of the, the shot. It's a really strange shot and it does the same for Bodhi as well and it kind of cuts between these two and then when Carver leans forward the camera leans forward with him and we get this more intimate view. We feel kind of totally against the wall and sort of splayed out amongst the scene and then it, we the, the shot becomes intimate with the intimacy of the scene itself as well. And just the fact that it's quite a humorous scene, this kind of ro- role reversal. Carver <laughs> goes in with the intention of being the good cop, plays all these things, get totally screwed by Bodhi, who they underestimate and is a lot, a lot more on the ball than they give him credit for. And he ends up beating the crap out of him. So <laughs> I, think that, I think that's a great scene. Beautifully yes, shot, uh... wonderfully acted. And it's, you know, it's nice to have light-hearted scenes like that just to break up some of the seriousness of the the uh, show's themes and uh, objects yeah it's, it's it's a very good choice i mean stark and carver in general are so great aren't they because they they serve this great kind of humorous purpose in season one and then they kind of diverge so well later on and become kind of serious characters one who doesn't develop at all and one who develops massively so it's just i think yeah just those characters in general are great and Again, another very another funny scene for him. I think so. the only thing that that uh, Herc really learns throughout the entire show is to knock before entering. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the only thing he actually learns. <laughs> yeah. He learns that very well. Yeah. But again, it gets him promoted. So <laughs> did he really? It learn puts anything? him in in the yeah. position to essentially be the most important character in bringing down Marlow. Yeah. He is essentially wholly responsible for that. Well, I mean, as as we know, he both builds and breaks the case. And learns realizing. nothing. <laughs> and learns nothing. It's beautiful. The process. <laughs> it's incredible. The but it's more, more on that as way. we get to those episodes. Yep. Season hopping, not allowed. Um, so, standout character. Uh, now, this one is genuinely difficult. Um Ooh, I mean, it's another. It's a very strong D'Angelo episode, I think. Um, and yeah. we see him in a lot of different scenarios here. We see him. We see a lot of vulnerability to the people and environment around him, and how he's struggling with a lot of his. In, you know, we we feel like he has quite a big internal dialogue or an internal monologue or whatever going on inside him. Especially, we see that in the restaurant. It's, uh, a restaurant scene and we see him conflicting with all these tiny little things going on people brushing past him certain things that people are saying Like, and I think um, I've forgotten the name of the actor that plays D'Angelo um, Larry Gilliard is Junior? that it? oh yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah. I mean he does an excellent job of displaying all of those nuances of his character and yeah we kind of we follow D'Angelo quite a lot in this episode and I think it makes him a bit of a standout I would say yeah yeah I'm 
have to boringly agree with you. Um, uh, well, if agreeing up... with me is boring, then... <laughs> the, the, the process of agreeing itself is boring. I'll go with that. Um, it's nice if we can have like differences, but D'Angelo is just very strong. You want to have uh, an argument, I understand. Yeah, we'll, just... we'll clash against something. Podcasts are built on clashes, and we haven't had many of them because The Wire is just kind of a very good show. But uh, I'm sure the discussion's been interesting, and Avon is kind of up there as well. I mean, this is almost Avon's episode, like the epigraph. Oh yeah, that's that's a. I was going to mention this earlier, actually, given the fact that we've seen very little of Avon in the previous yeah. episodes, and this is a massive Avon. This kind of opens episode. the opens the tomb to see kind of who Avon is, and that's once I, I was I was going to put Stringer there as well, but I mean we don't we don't see much of him, but that one scene with Stringer for me really really does does hit home. So, um, St- no, Stringer, really Avon, happens. and D'Angelo are all brilliant in this episode. It's a really yeah. I have to say it's a big toss up between them in reality. Yeah, that's the, those three I put down. Um, the triumvirate of favorite yeah. characters. The thing is, you only got to fuck up once. Be a little slow, be a little late, just once. And how you ain't gonna never be slow, never be late? You can't plan for no shit like this, man. It's life. Title thoughts. The pager. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot to say, I guess. Yes, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty on the nose. A, re- a return yeah. to the the format. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I mean, we know that much of the episode follows the results that comes from cloning the pager and cracking the code. Uh, but I can't yeah. really put my finger on much else other than that for this one. Yeah, I I struggled. Like I I think this is possibly the only, one of the only titles that doesn't really have a double meaning that I can find. Um, I thought maybe the AIDS was a very tenuous idea of like this this connectivity and communication, but I don't know. It was it's not even worth discussing because it doesn't really work. Um, uh, epigraph. Oh yeah, so it, it seems appropriate that in Avon's first kind of major focus uh, of an episode that he gets the epigraph as well. Yeah, uh, a little a little slow, a little late. Be it little slow. Be a little late. And uh, now you ain't never gonna be slow. <laughs> ain't never gonna be late. Yeah, apologize. <laughs> really, really apologize. Um, but that's the obviously that's he the says that in the hospital, in the care home scene. Yeah, with D'Angelo. Um, I guess it kind of there's a couple of things you can say. Firstly, this I mean it's part of a larger monologue, isn't it? Um, but it reflects somewhat in what he what is said earlier in the episode. Uh, with his paranoia, you know, he he knows that you can't plan for everything, but he seems to be trying anyway. He's still trying to take as many precautions as he can. Um, and there's that emphasis that everything hinges on these really small moments, these really tiny changes, you know, being a little bit slow or a little bit late. Um, and that's the same is true of all the discoveries that, say, for example, the detail makes in the wire. It's all these small little things that they hear, yeah. these tiny little codes that they crack. Somebody says something, somebody reveals something. You know, these everything kind of lives and dies based on these tiny little moments. And yet it seems so massive. It seems so big and scary. You know, he talks about um, his uncle, or, or his brother, rather. It's D'Angelo's uncle, but talks about the brother in the coma scaring him in some way as if it's this big scary thing when everything really hinges on these tiny little moments um yeah uh um, yeah i guess oh it, it also references i suppose the um the fact that if they got the wire up earlier yes that's that's, that's what the, i was that's thinking that's the big one do you that's, want to, do you want to say all... a little about that yeah, I mean, you said it just there. Like you, you, you can't don. I mean, it's uh, it almost feels like once you've seen the episode and look back at the epigraph, it was like ah, like that's what it meant. Like yeah, we were slow, we were late, and uh, we missed being able to. You know, Freeman picked it up, and he knew that the detail should have been up on the phones a few hours before those phones are used to commit a murder, and they were kind of slow and late as always. So. Um, and it really hammers that home at the end where we kind of see those communications coming through and we see yeah. the pager data and we're just thinking, you know, you have a wire up on those phones and you've you've got it all. 
Yeah, like, there it just, is. That's a consp- That's a conspiracy murder charge sort of thing. Yeah. Something very unsettling about just seeing it and such a stark kind of just beeps. Hearing it in terms of beeps, like the murder occur, and it's like, oh crap! Like, and the credits just roll. It's yeah, it's it's, it's quite. It's just very very frustrating for everyone. Possibly um, the most, in terms of its relation to the theming of the episode, it's a really really solid epigraph. Maybe the best so far. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. Um, definitely a lot of subtlety to it but it has very very strong bearing on what happens yeah definitely okay so yeah, I guess that's episode 5 there we go we're not too far off halfway through season 1 so made uh, made some decent progress already I'd say yeah um, do you want to close us out Alex uh, yeah, I guess uh, the only thing left to say is that uh, if you ever want to drop us a message, then you can email us at caughtonthewire at gmail.com and we're always updating the uh, blog and you can download all of the podcasts from the website at caughtonthewire.wordpress.com and unless there's anything else you want to add, Toby, before we go? No, no not at all. It's been good. Yeah when we will see you uh, next week in the next episode of Caught on the Wire. Until then, enjoy your week. What you know about Baltimore? What you know about Baltimore? Baltimore. What you know about Baltimore? What you know about Baltimore? Baltimore.